Kenneth Trujillo. What's up, brother? Bro, how do you build yourself? Because I know you a little bit, and I know you, this is not a, a thing that, oh, you just were, were born with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How have you built yourself as an actor? Yeah, before we get into that, brother, it's, it's good to see you. It's been, I think, three <laughs> years since we were in person. So, salud, brother. Salud. So, cheers, yeah. Like you said, it's a craft. So anything that's going to be quality takes takes a lot, a lot of time, you know. And uh, it's about understanding where you want to be, and how you want to grow, and where you are right now, you know. And and uh, when I started acting, the irony was that I wanted to pursue acting when there weren't really any more opportunities were happening because the journey for me started in North Carolina. And so there were a couple of things that happened. The tax incentive went away, it wasn't renewed. Some legislation got passed. And so the rest of the uh, productions that were still in the Carolinas, you know, they finished and whatever dried out, dried out, and the rest kind of moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And so, you know, it was understanding that, you know, if I want to do this, how am I going to continue to grow uh, in my craft? How am I going to continue to learn and uh, I think that's the base of where you start is you have to have a plan of how you continue to educate yourself because anybody who wants to practice any artistic discipline mm -hmm. you know there are a, a myriad of options of how you do that but I don't think that any of them really exclude education that that's the basis and so mm -hmm. you know if you want to be a good carpenter you have to learn about the different tools that you have to use and, yeah. and the different materials so so did you have like a specific training that you went and studied with someone to specific class yeah yeah like yeah that grow? yeah uh 1000 percent uh i uh trained out of charlotte north carolina in the mcglone theater and i trained with a acting instructor named linda ann watt and uh i hold her class very near and dear to my heart because uh she was very nurturing and, and kind of maternal, you know, in that sense, and really cared about um, helping you grow as an artist. And the foundation of her class was kind of Stanislavski and uh, Kat Sellis and, and Stella Adler. And so it was a lot of uh, use of the imagination and as if and then, you know, uh, a, a little bit of, of method and understanding those practices. And, and that's where it started, I think. It was once a week, and uh, I think her initial class was like a 12-week class, but I continued to study in an ongoing class, and I would do pop-ins or, uh, you know, reach out to her to help, uh, you know, with some auditions that I might have. So mm -hmm. that was the basis of it, is getting into a foundational acting class and begin to do uh, scene work and, and really begin to read a lot. Yeah, that was the biggest thing is I, I didn't read a lot of plays and and I really encourage I know the era in which we're in right now but I think that you squeeze the the most juice out of this art form if you read plays because it's longer form you know and it's it's uh it, it really is this world building you know you watch a play and you see all these different characters and you see what motivates them and you see what how they experience the world and maybe between them and another character or them by themselves and, and it really allows you to have a profound respect and appreciation for narrative mm -hmm. and so that's kind of where it started for me and that's kind of how i got started man so tell me when you first got into do things on camera because mm -hmm. uh, i think acting for theater with other actors in the class is awesome super fun yeah very necessary i started doing some theater when i was a kid i acted for i started when i was like four or five okay. on plays yeah and all the way until i was like 15 16 then i started directing the the little plays that were putting together and then i started shooting things and then i went into the directing route but it's so different like acting in a class although it's amazing on camera is completely different. You have been on TV shows and yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big productions where you know that you only get a window of like, okay, now we're ready for you. Go. Yeah. Like you don't have... The light. Go, 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 go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, those, those things happen that way. And I, um, I think the better, the, the best way for it to kind of be illustrated is, um, you know, acting in theater is kind of like operating with a scalpel. That's how I ha I've had it described to me. So acting in theater is kind of like operating with a scalpel and operating on TV and film you know, or acting in TV and film is like operating with a laser. 
very specific and and you know you know you're you're filling a frame and you're conscious of it hey you're moving too much can you you know yeah hey, it's like you know. from this yeah. to this it's also not you know it's uh, acting is very big you know because you have to fill the space and you have mm -hmm. to make people feel things and and it depends on the size of the theater it could be a small black box theater that doesn't sit any more than 25 people or it could be theater in the round where you have 300 people around you so it's inhabiting your character having this big energy that gets mm -hmm. people involved that keeps them captivated you know and, and then film and tv is different in the sense of having spatial awareness and and understanding the strength of your emotions you know come from your eyes you know they, they they tell a very huge story you know and, and it's anything you do you know, the camera's right there you know mm -hmm. the little things so it's also the nuance which is important you know why you why it's important to study mm -hmm. you know is, is to have all these feelings to know that when you look at that person it's like well they don't want to upset their mom but also, they want to appease their girlfriend, and and they don't want to disappoint their father. And you 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 can you can tell all those things by how I'm emoting and and and, and the use of you know inflection and all these other different things and then other technical things that come from you know studying TV and film because also TV and film right there's a there's a difference in tempo you know in in a movie there could be a slow burn you know you're really sitting in that emotion in a TV show hey we got. 32, we got 30 minutes, 22 minutes really, because we have commercials. So we got to move. You know, you got to know what you want, your, how your character is involved, where it fits in the story, and keep it moving. Yeah. So, uh, and that's the importance of studying is you, you learn all those things, man. You know, the, the foundational aspect of acting, the appreciation for theater, the reading great literature, and then going to things like uh, script breakdowns and understanding that you're there to serve the script. The writing is, if it's good writing, is really, really powerful. Uh, and it's about understanding, you know, what is this telling me about my character? What is this telling me about the story? Uh, and, you know, that, that's kind of the importance of, of doing all those things. But yeah, very true, man. Uh, these disciplines are all very different in, very, the, in the way you different. execute them. And it, it's important to yeah. kind of know that. So tell me a little bit about TV. You had a role in, was it Better Call Saul? Mm-hmm. Mm. yeah 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 yeah. that was crazy man like when i saw that i was so happy for you bro thank you brother because like i'm a huge breaking bad fan yeah i think it's one of the best tv shows ever yeah and then better call Saul. i didn't finish everything but the pieces that i saw like i think i watched season one and two yeah it was like very motion it's the same showrunner same people same vibe yeah, yeah 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 so tell me about that experience man um I love telling this story because I, I, you know, I don't know the man all that well aside from working with him, but I genuinely love Vince Gilligan. I, I, I think he's the man, you know, it's, uh, he's a craftsman. You, you talk about craftsmanship, right? Mm -hmm. He's a real craftsman. He knows what he wants. It's really so impressive when you're working with someone who has a clear cut vision of, of how they see this narrative being, being carried out, you know, and, and he directed this particular episode. I think it's episode eight of season five if i'm not mistaken but i got to work with very very talented craftsmen in different regards you know special effects makeup stunts the stunt coordinator named al Godo, an og of the stunt community who did the barrel roll at the end his name is Corey eubanks and he's got a great story and and, and his pedigree is really interesting and then I, i spent the better part of five days with a ton of stunt actors and their life and their hustle and their craftsmanship is way different, but it really informs uh, my artistry and, and my craftsmanship and, and the level of discipline that you have to have, you know, and, and uh, execution and safety. Because some of those things you don't get uh, a second go at. You know, there's a, there's a there's a moment, a handful of things happen, but uh, uh, there's a moment where a bullet pierces a glass. And uh, there's an actor, a stunt actor by the name of uh, Algin Ace Mendez, and uh, he's right behind the car. And, and I think the action is that he turns, and right as he turns, and the bullet comes right there. And the thing is, you don't get another one of those. I mean, you might, but you're talking about setup time of like, okay, now we have to replace the windshield because mm -hmm. it, was, it was very specific to those things. And you see, you know, working on a show like that, um, being captained uh, by a guy like Vince Gilligan is like, when when you know what you want and uh, you've built the team around you then it it it, f it really feels like smooth sailing 
Yeah. Uh, Even though it's completely chaos under control. Yeah, yeah, it's control chaos, man. And you and you talk about that. Like our our call times on that set was uh, 4 a.m. You know, uh, uh, like 4 a.m. landing on set, and the reason is, you, you know, you're shooting you Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, who knows when they were there? Transport needed to be there like yeah. at one in the morning. Yeah. If well, they usually come set up the base camp the day before and yeah. all that. But like, yeah, that that would be insane too. It's insane, you know. And you're talking about, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm over exaggerating. I don't know how many people out there, but it certainly felt like a hundred people out there yeah, in the at least desert. Like a show like that is between a hundred and yeah. fifty people. You know, you're operating in triple digit heat and you have all different types of departments. You have mm-hmm. two people dedicated just to like wild animals, snake wrangling out there. Yeah. And then, and then you have your transport, your special effects, makeup, your stunt uh, coordinator and supervisors. Mm-hmm. And then you have the, all these stunt guys and yeah. uh, the camera department, all these other things. And you're out there in the elements, man. So mm-hmm. if, if you don't know uh, what you want, it, things can become very hectic very quickly, but it wasn't that way, yeah. you know. And so, how was his relationship with actors specifically? Like, he how loves did him. he talk to you guys? He loves and him. I, uh, he was the first person I met on set, and uh, so to back out of that, you know, I had auditioned for Better Call Saul a handful of times, and uh, I had auditioned for some speaking roles, and so when I auditioned for this episode, it was actually for a role. Uh, the guy who uh, runs and picks up the duffel bags and then he gets shot and he falls face down is a very talented actor and stunt actor named uh, Gabriel Rodriguez. He goes by G-Rod. He knew what he wanted for the scene. You know, I had auditioned for the show numerous times and uh, I had auditioned for that role. I got offered a role, but it wasn't that the one that I auditioned for. So I was just like, man, I don't want to be on a show and just and then die and then like yeah. not have the opportunity to come to back come or back, have yeah. other episodes and so i said you know respectfully no i turned it down uh and then like a week and a half later my uh agent sends me an email of dialogue that she had with the casting director and it was hey you know we know that kenny turned us down and we know that he's auditioned before for speaking roles uh vince really wants him in this scene and if it's any consolation you know He'll be directly opposite Bob Odenkirk, and at the time I was, I was broke. So at it came, you know, the opportunity came back, and at that point I was like, "What's the rate?" You know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyways, I end up, you know, taking the role, fly out there. He's the first person that I meet on set, which is the reason why you talk about specificity of knowing what you want. And so I didn't know that I met him. Because I'm standing next to a guy who's wearing like this fishing kind of camping style uh-huh. hat with these black glasses and a blue gator covering his nose because we're in the desert. Yeah. And uh, he goes, hey, good morning, Kenneth. We're happy to have you here. And he, and he walks off. And somebody leans to me and they were like, that was Vince. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, so everybody that he knows uh, and uh, you talk about that level of personability and the things that he welcomes. You know, he had a very great working relationship with Bob Odenkirk, and that was really beautiful to see. He just, the, you know, he knows what he wants specifically, but he, you know, Bob would come and he's, oh, what if I try this? And you know, just like a kid, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you really actually see that. I mean, there's a YouTube link. Uh, maybe you can link it. Um, but it's Vince's breakdown of that episode. And what's beautiful about that is it's about, I think it's about 30, 35 minutes. And as he goes along explaining what they set out to do, he's also championing everyone who was involved, from the actors to the different departments that were responsible for Mm -hmm. really enriching the script. You know, so he he really does champion that and uh, it's wonderful to see. You know, it's it's the it was the shortest amount of screen time I've had to be there so long because those episodes they normally knock out in like seven, eight days. This scene alone, that firefight, was five days of shooting wow. in the desert. And, like, I was reminded by that. You know, I, I, uh, uh, the actor Jonathan Banks, who plays Mike, you know, mm-hmm. we hung out and we had drinks and a group of the guys went out for dinner. But that was one thing. It's like, hey, you know, you value those things because normally those episodes, you know, they're, they're done in seven, eight days. Yeah. But the concentration of five days just for this scene and then that barrel roll scene... You know, so that dedication, he really champions his talent. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. He set the highest bar, you know, because 
how, how could he not? You know, he's directed two of the biggest TV shows mm -hmm. that have ever graced television. Yeah. And he has that level of personability with his talent, with his cast, with his crew. And he has a level of vision of how we're going to execute this. And then welcome, welcoming, you know, whatever you want to, whatever you're going to bring. Yeah, were so you was, nervous when you were there, like, and having to... Uh, n no, not really. Uh, I wasn't at all. The only thing that... Uh, <laughs> I was so hot uh, that, this, that right where I threatened Bob and I had my arm extended, I couldn't stop my arm from, like, kind of trem <laughs> trembling just, just there in, in the heat. And so they, they had to put a, a stand under my hand. Uh, <laughs> to hold your yeah, hand? just to hold my hand so it wouldn't move for that shot because it's it's Vince throws his hands up, cuts back to me, and it's like I go boom, mm -hmm. cut back to him, cut back to me, and then you know, but my hand is on a stand at that yeah. point. And you also have to hold your hand out for like yeah, 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 a long, 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 yeah. long, long, long time to actually shoot it. Yeah, that's hilarious. Do you have? It would be funny to see a picture of you like in the desert with the stand. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure it's. I'm sure it lives somewhere. There was a unit still awesome. photography there, and they took a bunch of different photos. Like, you know, uh, I think uh, I think three out of the actors that were there also had uh, stunt dummies. Because at the end of that scene, you know, I'm dead. So when we shot it, by day two, I was already dead. But because of the composition of the scene and coverage go uh, back. yeah and i'm and i'm there so like bob is crawling over me so but i had like a stunt double dummy because at the end of that scene spoiler alert um i get run over so i think like three of the stunt guys had like stunt dummies and there's yeah. photos of all that stuff and the special effects makeup that's and so cool, all those things were really cool just you know and that's what you really appreciate um about uh working on a project of his mm -hmm. is the level of uh dedication Uh, of enriching the story because mm -hmm. of all these different departments that were doing all these different things to make that so memorable. You know, I've seen GIFs of the, those scenes and like small snippets from all these different parts. I didn't know how big that particular episode was going to be. So it was, it was pretty cool to be a part of something that ended up being way bigger than I That's thought awesome. it was going to be. And you almost said no. I did say no. You did say no, and then I did say back. no, and he said, "You know, we want you." And, yeah. and uh, so I was, I was very happy yeah. to be there, and the experience that I got as a result of that, you know, yeah. was was amazing. So, how does it work from the from a business standpoint? Because uh, you're making the decision, like, do I take this role? I don't want to take it because I'm going to die. If I die, I don't get a chance to like stay on with more lines. Yeah, more lines means more days, different rate with SAG, this and that. One thousand percent. Yeah. I, for me, it was more about um, being being able to be a part of a narrative, mm -hmm. and not just you're in, you're out, and it's done. Yeah, of course, yeah, you know, understandable. And sometimes, it's this dichotomy of like, do you take a, a gig just because you get the opportunity, or do you say no so you save yourself for a bigger role or for a bigger project? And I struggle with that sometimes too. It's like. Now I'm saying yes to this project because I'm broke and I need the money. But then by doing this project, I'm being a, a, unavailable to then take on another opportunity that could come later. So let's talk a little bit about like the business side of acting. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting agents, working with managers, negotiating rates, all of that. How, how do you navigate all of that? What are some things that you completely hate about it or love about it? Because I know it's extremely difficult. Sure. Uh, for actors to make a living just acting full time. I'm fortunate in that I was in the business world before I decided to be an actor. I was in sales. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the jobs that I held were like 75 to 100% commission. So if you don't have a plan, you know, to go out there every day and you don't have goals, long term and, and, and short term goals with regards to the sales and, and things you're going to close, you're not going to eat. So the same thing, the understanding of like that pipeline of projects that you're working on. Sure, there are projects that, uh, you know, uh, more money. Sure, there are projects that are uh, might seem smaller. In the beginning, it's it's all about work and, you know, you have to have that experience. And and that's the catch-22 of, you know, starting with like finding an agent. Well, to find an agent, they need to see your work on camera. And then the catch-22 is, but I need an agent to book work. Um, but 
it's important to take stock and, and take inventory and reverse engineer those things. And I'm sure anywhere or just getting online, you can find a community of people who are working on projects and you can get your feet wet. You can work with local universities like in Atlanta, there's, there's SCAD, GSU, there's Emory. Uh, and then not too far away, there's Florida State University. So mm -hmm. you can work on projects as you continue to grow your experience on camera and kind of leverage those opportunities to then put together a reel uh, or different clips of different characters that you've been able to uh, inhabit in a narrative and then, you know, pitch yourself out to uh, agents and you can find those agents by being diligent and going online mm -hmm. and the SAG AFTRA uh, website will show agencies that are SAG franchised yeah. you know so you know that you're working with a reputable agent was uh, it hard for you like reaching out reaching out reaching out and then getting responses uh, uh no no uh I had the good fortune of you know when I started acting uh my first agent in the Carolinas came by way of a recommendation of a friend who I would help self-tape. And when I decided to pursue acting, I met with him uh, at her going away party when she was going to New York. So I talked to him for like five minutes at the party, and then we agreed to meet. I think we had lunch two weeks later, and we talked about the business of acting. You know, it's like, you have to be in a, in a, in a class consistently. You know, these are the quality materials that I expect from you, headshots and reels. Uh, And you still have to audition for me. I'm not just going to hire you because a friend of a friend said, hey, this guy wants to act. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was all those things working diligently. And from there, you know, the gradual ascension of finding a, a, a bigger agent, you know, and, and that came by way of my acting coach. Because originally I stood uh, studying at an acting studio for about a year and a half in Charlotte. And then my thought process was, I think I'm going to move to L.A., my very nurturing acting coach was like, well, I have a friend who has a boutique agency in Atlanta. She has her agency in LA, but she has this boutique agency in Atlanta. Let me talk to her. And I can't make any promises. Let's see if I can organize a meeting. Yeah. So same thing. Met with her, auditioned for her. She saw some of my past material. I signed with her. I moved down. And then, you know, it's like... And that's when we met, because we met right when you moved to Atlanta. I felt like the agency that I was with didn't understand what I was trying to do artistically. And then, you know, again, the competence of business is like, this is a business. Yeah. You know, if you're not being represented the way you want to be represented, it's no slight. It's just, where do you want to head? And is there anything getting in the way of that? Uh -huh. Is it you making the indecision of, well, I don't know, you know, I'm going to stay with them because they gave me a shot. It's, it's, you know, that, that aspect yeah. isn't personal. It's tricky because part of me thinks, well, they took you in when you were like starting out. Sure. So you should be loyal and stay with them. But I also understand your position of like, hey, if we are not getting the results that we need, then we need to make a change. Yeah. And I, I mean that more from like the artistic side because I let that be in the guiding light the business is absolutely 1000% important but like what stories am I being sent out to audition for you know and without any hubris without there are people who they think they're ready for something that they're not that's not the, that's not the point it's like once you know what you're doing and w once you know uh, what you're putting into practice every day and how, how much you're dedicating to your art If somebody doesn't see and really understand the direction you want to head, you know, I, I, I have nothing against loyalty, but when it comes in direct opposition of like how you want to grow as an artist, then, you know, it's time to make a change. And like the only constant is change. So this fear of like, well, you know, you just, uh, you know, you have to take those things deeply yeah. into consideration. But Are you guys in some sort of contract that wouldn't allow you to do that? Or I, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I, I don't know how it is for other actors. I just know what my experience is, you know, because I, at the time I had an agency representing me for uh, print and modeling. And then I had an agency repping me solely for commercial work. And, and then I had a, a, a theatrical agent. So, you know, I didn't have anything. They all knew each other. That wasn't, I, there was no secrets of like, oh, I got this guy for that and this guy for that. No, they all knew, you know. And, and for me, it was like, I want to continue <clears throat> to work. And... Um, You know, are you guys comfortable with whoever brings me these opportunities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was fortunate in that sense. But at the same time, you know, I think 
it's important to be pragmatic and and things can get ugly and I, I know they have for some people that they like an agency may not want to let them go but i wasn't in that position mm-hmm. i don't understand that because at the end of the day i think it's worth being pragmatic and an adult and saying well, hey, this thing, ain't working out and the thing is like if i'm an agent and i'm helping you and you're with me for like a couple of years or whatever and then i have gotten you all these roles yeah, yeah yeah that foundation is usually what allows you to book the next thing like in our business what have you done oh he was on better call Saul. that's an asset mm-hmm. so like if i was your agent and i got you that sure and then you leave me six months later a year later yeah no i think i think usually the minimum point of entry with a with a, an agreement that you do sign with representation is normally like a year or two yeah and that's understandable because mm-hmm. uh, that relationship has to ha- be allowed the time to cultivate right because that, that's the other thing it can't be like well they don't get me and it's like well how long is you've been with them three months because that happens too, you know, there's representation everywhere that somebody's like, well, I had a bad experience or others where people are like, they're the best in the world. Mm-hmm. So everybody's experience is individual. I just yeah. say that like, once you know what you want to do, if you're really being true to yourself and understanding where you really are at, mm-hmm. nothing should get in the way of that. Absolutely nothing. And, and, you know, to have blind loyalty that way, I think is detrimental to your well your artistic well-being yeah and also we we are involved in a business that requires i call that desperate patience you need to know that aggressive this is, patience yeah aggressive patience. i think you aggressive patience aggressive patience you need to know that this is going to take a very long time but then you have to wake up every day and go at it as there's like no tomorrow and it has to happen today yeah yeah, it's yeah. like this dichotomy of like those two things that need to happen at the same time because yeah. you and i like we met in 2017 that yeah. was five years ago yeah we have talked about working on several projects i yeah. went to cassie on the on the show with sam uh, called after death mm-hmm. uh we tried to develop that project we had to put a pause on it yeah we worked on in documentada the, yeah. the film with andres yeah uh, the short and that happened kind of like yeah out of the blue like yeah that wasn't planned it was like a phone call hey can you are you available i got this like can you do it for me like uh so it's interesting how things take so long but at the same time it feels like things just happen like oh boom 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 you did this you did this you were in north carolina you took a class then you went to atlanta then you got this then you're on better call soul and now you're an actor yeah how do you manage that in your head because it's something that I'm struggling with the whole time. Like, I feel like I'm so old. I haven't done what I want to yeah. do. <laughs> like, I'm so behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I'm like, I, I'm not even starting. Like, I, yeah. I haven't even, like, touched the surface of the beginning of what my film career could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you handle that? Staying in the moment, enjoying the process. Because whatever you're experiencing today, is, it won't be like that tomorrow. You know, the, the jobs you work on today and the experience you gain today won't be the same experience you gain tomorrow. And it's important to appreciate how that opportunity came about for you to grow, even if it's just a little bit today, because all those things compound. And then you'll look back before you know it and you'll be like, wow, man, I've been able to experience a lot. Because if not, it becomes, you know, I had a friend tell me, uh, I think this was like two days ago, we were just talking and uh, having this conversation about di- different filmmakers and awards and festivals, the, all these ceremonies and all these festivals are coming up. He said, you're not your accolades. Talking about, you know, and, and oftentimes we look at for things to define us of whether or not this year was successful because, you know, I won at South by Southwest or, you know, all the festivals that I submitted this project to got I got accepted for those things and it's, it's you're not your accolades you know you're 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 a collection of your experiences so to be on this road and to be on this artistic journey and solely gauging it by the amount of work you booked or the the amount of money that you made from those jobs you booked or those accolades that you received from those projects you worked on you get into real trouble, man, because then you're you're looking for. I, I mean, in my opinion, these artificial ways to define uh, what success is, and I and I think that if every day, you, you know, you're progressively working towards a worthy ideal, then then you are successful, you know. And, and it's important, you know. Coming from a business, uh, from the business world, I used to be in a networking group, and I'll never forget. 
there was this guy who stood up and we were going around doing this kind of one minute recap of what, what type of referrals would be good for our business. And he detracted just from that to tell the story about an older gentleman who said something to him. And he said, son, I promise you, if you go slower, you'll go faster. You know, and it's, a, and it's a reminder that in anything that you're doing, if you want to be good at something, it's a slow roast, not a microwave dinner. You know, and, the, and you, you know, you, know you, you have family members that, you know, ellos pasan el día entero cocinando. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ese plato, you're going to devour it in 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. But that was five hours of preparation. Mm -hmm. So that everybody could sit down and then be like this and be like, oh, yeah, well, you're killing me. <laughs> and it's like so good. It's so rich. It's so soulful. So the work that you're doing that really matters, like if you're putting in that time and, and, and the consideration for the things that you're doing is, is in the work and the process, you're going to take so much joy. You're going to get so much joy out of the process. And so it's, it's the staying ever present in the work that you're doing, not, not, not having plans for the future, but not letting that bog you down because, you know, man, I thought by year X, I would be here. Mm -hmm. It's good to have that, to like, hey, you know, we're journeying, we know on this trail. And you'll be surprised, you know, when you're focused on, on the process yeah. and the work, every now and again, you know, it's like hiking on a trail where it's like all of a sudden you're like, dude, am I lost? And you're looking around and all of a sudden, 100 yards up, you see a mile marker on the tree and you're like, Oh, I'm going in the right direction. Yeah. Those things happen to you in, in your in art career. and in business. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think it's a mix of that, what you're saying of like being in the moment and enjoying everything. But at the same time, to me, there is things that you do measure because for example, like let's be objective. Like yeah. Steven Spielberg is a way better filmmaker than I am. So that's sure. my like North star. And there are ways of measuring that. Academy Awards. I don't want to detract from that, but a friend of mine asked me, what's the first uh, movie you ever remember watching in theaters? And Jurassic Park was the first Jurassic Park. I, that I consciously remember watching in the yeah. theaters. But anyways. I think for me, movie. it was an old Spanish movie that I watched in a movie theater in Havana. Uh, I don't remember the movie. I just remember it was running on 35 mil. I sat at the on the first seat shitty theater it cost two bucks to go in yeah in like two cuban pesos yeah yeah, yeah. which is like 10 cents in the u.s yeah and it was it was magical it was yeah. like pretty good i was like wow this is really good yeah but if i if i look at that as a as a measuring stick i haven't made the movies that i want to make i haven't made the money that i want to make sure so i am less successful than that person but at the same time i have just done everything in my hands to try to go on that path yeah and that's i guess the best way to measure it and maybe only use goals to give you a north star yeah yeah, yeah. some type of barometer for what you do yeah like i want to get there for me it's like yeah. i want to win an academy award yeah before i die yeah. that's like one of the main things that i want to accomplish in my life sure and sometimes kenneth i'm not doing what i should be doing to get me closer to that yeah, and and, and, okay. and what? And, but in what? In what regard do you do you say I'm not? Is it like I need to work on scripts more? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I need to be reading more. I but you, but you're conscious of those things, which is I important. Am. But it's again, it's this balance. Uh, I'm a very like strict person. I'm yeah. very black and white. Sure. In the last couple of years, I've been learning how to be more fluid. Yeah. And I think I I am becoming more that. Yeah. So I'm accepting a bit more that sense of it's not that I'm failing. It's just that what you're going after is hard. So it's yeah. okay that it's taking time. It's okay that it's a struggle. Yeah. And I think it should be. Anything that's worth it. If you're not struggling, it's not worth it. You know, and you, you got to you gotta appreciate the struggle. Mm -hmm. It makes you tougher. It makes you more disciplined. It also teaches you not to necessarily take yourself so seriously all the time. I think those things are inherently important. That's, that's a big one. Yeah. I think that's a big one because I think that one allows you to enjoy more what you're doing. Fuck yeah. And going back to what your, your friend was saying, if you can go long, slow, because you're enjoying it, you can go longer. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we need to, and this is also coming from the people that I hang around and the people that I'm 
working with yeah yeah yeah. they go so hard yeah like whenever i'm close to like i work with tom bilyeu and lisa bilyeu yeah whenever i'm they're hanging out with them and seeing how they're moving yeah it's like dude i'm going in slow-mo yeah, like yeah, even yeah. though i'm i'm doing a lot by any standard sure when you look at my calendar when you look at all the people that i meet all the projects that i have in the air all the things that i have going on i'm i'm busy i'm 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 moving along i'm doing okay yeah 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 but then i go and hang out with tom and it's like holy shit like the way this guy's moving so there is a lot of room to cover yeah 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 I just think that we need to be aware of that, and it's okay to say, "I'm not that good." I need absolutely, to get absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, if you if better. you can't if you can't do that, then I think you lack self awareness. And like, yeah. I meet people, you know, I, we you, you talk about like uh, mental health, but I I think being self aware is directly correlated to what your mental health is because I. I think that you should be your harshest critic, 1,000%. But I also feel that you should be your loudest champion. A hundred percent, yeah. If it's not that way, you know, I don't know what you're doing because you, you, you have to have some type of, you know, to a degree, a metric of saying, am I doing everything that I said I was going to be doing? And if not, why? You know, maybe it's, maybe it's like I'm trying to emulate something that intrinsically is not true to me and mm -hmm. my process and how I want to do things. That's yeah. fine, okay? Let's take a look at that. Let's pivot, yeah. adjust, and, and act accordingly. So so how are you dealing with people in your life who might not get behind the dream and what you want to do? It's not your dream, you know? I can't, I, don't, I can't have the expectation that you value my dream as much as I value my dream. It's called your dream. You know, no one should care more about what you want to do than you so i think worrying about uh you know it's not it's not not true to my journey i've had people who didn't believe in me or didn't understand like hey what do you what do you want to do that you know and, and they have their own ideas of like what this journey what this endeavor what this career uh might mean so it's not their dream and if you get bogged down with like, well, I just felt like my mom, you know, should be on board. Or I just feel like all my friends should be on board. I mean, it's great if they do, 1,000%, man. Support systems are super important. And you can't do anything without a solid team. And that comes from like a professional team or familial team. Those things are inherently important to be challenged in the right way. So, um, but I don't really invest the time in like who doesn't or, or, or does believe in me. Um, when you do have the people who believe in you and they want to help you, I think it's inherently to let inherently important to let them know how they can help you. It's not just saying, Axel, you did a great job. We saw your last movie and it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Tell me what resonated most with my project. And also like being welcoming of like, hey, that angle that you shot there in that particular scene, why did you do that? And then maybe they'll tell you, well, I didn't really care for it. But why? You know, it comes, it comes from something that is like progressively reflective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you want to help me? Like, challenge me in the most positive of ways to help me grow. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's not caring what other people think about your dreams. But when you do have people who do care about your dreams, it's like, nurture that. You know, tell them, you know, the way that you can be of help for me is, you know, asking me challenging questions you know, asking me hey Axel you know how many minutes a day or hours a day are you dedicating towards whatever it is that you want to kind of continue to grow at whether it's like mm -hmm. composition or lighting or like are you studying mm -hmm. you know what what does that look like because in the best of ways it's reflective and you're like oh man you're right I'm not I'm not yeah so I wanted to ask you when you were talking about that with people not like uh getting behind what you need how has that worked out for you in like romantic relationships because i think that's a, a big big thing for actors that we don't really know a lot sure because the the job of being an actor is very like it could be amazing for relationships because like as you get more famous and more well known sure. you have more options yeah but also your schedule is a nightmare yeah. Your financial stability is very like up and down. 
and I also think your personality and, and the way that actors feel and live for someone who's not accustomed to that or into that could be very challenging. I just think that it's important that, you know, in any relationship, whether it's romantic, familial or business, that, you know, you be clear about uh, how you feel and how you want to move and being being in love with yourself first, you know. I, I truly believe that. I think I love myself if these are the things that I say that I care about. Am I taking care of myself the way a father takes care of their children? You know, so I think at first it starts with the nurturing of oneself rather than, you know, making it an external thing. I think it starts internally, you know, and your father, right? So it's like, I'm sure that there's things that you've done that like, Maybe it was just you. I'm like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. But the responsibility of that you have. So taking that, right, and bringing that home is like, you have another child, and that's baby Axel. So what wouldn't you do to feed baby Axel, that's to put a shirt on baby Axel's back, to put food in baby Axel's stomach? And that, and, and, and I mean that like, in the literature that you read and what you're inspired by and what you're intaking. So I think, you know, before taking it external, because th those, again, those things can get really hairy, right? Because it's like, well, it didn't work out with her or did not work out with him because of this, that, and, and the other, or my schedule, blah, 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 blah. But that might be true, but is it really, you know, what kind of relationship do you have with yourself first? And then really having that, honest conversation with yourself will allow you to better communicate with the people that you want in your life and the relationships that you value that you want to continue to nurture you know but at, at the end of the day if you have people in your life who are impeding your progress i think it behooves you to take a look at that and say are these relationships relationships that I continue to value and that I continue to want in my life. And that's a very difficult conversation, but it makes life all the better when you when you when you do that. Effective communication is important in anything you do. Yeah, of course. So, uh in your experience has it been better to like be with someone who's in the business, understands everything that we do and all that or is it better to be with someone? That I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'd hate to say something that steers people in one way or the other. I'll simply say that, like, I've met people who have done both. You know, I've met people who don't want to date anybody in the industry because somehow or another, it's it's like a, it's like this it's thicket like of solitude. It's this peace to come home to someone that's not related, that we're not talking about, like, uh, 16 hours on set or uh, I hate this producer or man, I don't know where my next thing is going to But I've also met people who absolutely love having someone who's in a who similar boat. Yeah. Uh, you know, That's the there's different thing. flavors for different folks and it, but just have that uh, effective communication with yourself first and then take everything else outward outside of that. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Yeah. So going back to something we were talking about before we started rolling, the whole... Do you have to be in LA or do you, can you make, make it anywhere else? What's your take on that? The landscape of media is changing so much. You know, this, this whole thing that you have to be in one place to make something happen. That's like a very fancy way to re reply to that question. The landscape of media is changing but, but so it, much. But it, it's the truth. I mean, you know, you, let's, let's take it away from yeah. the business of, uh, of film and cinema uh -huh. and TV. And let's, you know, we have examples already, you know, the amount of NBA players who no longer play in like what would be marquee cities because mm. I don't have to. I have my brand. I have my podcast. You know, I play for, I don't Whatever know, I play team. Oklahoma City. You know, that yeah. was a big thing with Kevin Durant, right? Where they were like, where's he going to play next? Is it going to be New York? Is it going to be LA? Is it going to be blah, 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 blah. And people would say, well, you know, a lot of these, and I'm a Knicks fan, so it hurts, you know, that yeah. a lot of people don't want to come to play for New York, but they don't have to anymore. 
You know, New York was like, oh, the mecca for fashion and media and, and the mecca for basketball. Yeah, but you could you could be anywhere. I, I think there's a, that's fair. There's a huge advantage. I, I'm a city guy. Like I love the city. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a huge advantage when you are in a place where your immediate circle is full of people everywhere who yeah. are moving, doing things, like all of that. But I'm always open to the idea. I think yeah. also. I mean, if you talk about Kevin Durant, he's someone who's already established, so he can pretty much go anywhere if you have your your brand and, and all of your things set up. I feel like for the average person trying to get started in the business, I see a huge difference between being... I, I lived in Atlanta for a few years. I, I won't say that that's not true, right? But mm -hmm. it, it's uh, because it's like, um, how many people will you be around that are as serious as you are about your craft, mm -hmm. that create their own opportunities and that are on productions that are continuing to flourish. So yes, mm -hmm. but I think that that becomes a conversation more about density. You know, being yeah. in a metropolis, that's gonna that's gonna exist. Yeah. Um, but I think that you can be diligent. You know, to have connections that you make online. Mm -hmm. to, uh, what you yeah. can't be afraid of is you can't be afraid to move if you need to. That's that, you yeah. know, so it's, I'm not saying that you have to be any one particular place to say, well, if you're not in L.A. or if you're not in New York City or if you're not in Atlanta, it's not going to work. No, mm -hmm. if you're doing the work to be able to build those connections in those places and then when the time comes and then, hey, hey, we need you out here for three months. Oh, well, I can't. No, go. I'm out and, yeah. and I'm going to make these things happen. Yeah, so. I think there I do agree with you that the landscape of media has changed yeah. because now projects get shot everywhere yeah i think because everything has become more accessible you have qualified people everywhere so before you couldn't really find good crew outside of like la and new york now that has spread out a lot yeah. uh it's just like funny to me when people try to make the argument against saying that yeah it's better here it's not necessary i don't think the necessary thing it makes any sense yeah unless you're not utilizing the resources and the connections and the people around you to the max. Like if you're not doing that, then you got to stay where you are. Like stay there until you grow and, and you are ready to then make the next step. Because if you were not like making it the best out of it, like in a small town, when you come to a big town, it's not gonna happen. Like I'm sorry. <laughs> like yeah. you're you're going to you're just gonna get crushed. You're not gonna change your habits because you live in it. Well, I mean, you might and push come to shove if it's yeah. like, but luck will you know, come into play. Yeah, like you're gonna have better connections. I mean, your your roommate is gonna be more connected to a business here in LA than if you are in the middle of the country somewhere. Uh, but yeah, if you're not getting up and doing all the things that you have to do, sure. it's like the cost of living is higher. So you need to perform. You need to do more things. Uh, but it's always interesting. I just like this conversation a lot, so I, I keep asking people about it. No, I think it's interesting because it's different for every everyone. But like for me, at the end of the day, it's like you have you know you have to take stock. Again, like it's so important to reverse engineer things because mm -hmm. you know you can. I, well, I just came from uh, the Rio Grande Valley. I was in, in McAllen, Texas, and for the South Texas International Film Festival in Edinburgh. And uh, they have a wonderful art council there, man. They, they really care about cultivating homegrown talent. And so some other actors and some directors and some producers, some special effects people that they had come out to speak at this workshop panel. And, um, you know, myself and another actor were speaking about, you know, the, the audition process and acting on TV and film and, and you know, hey, by a show of hands, how many of you are, are aspiring actors? How many of you are directors? And it's like, look around. Those are people who you can you can help each other, man. Mm -hmm. You continue to grow, and the stories that they have there in the Rio Grande Valley aren't like stories anywhere else, which inherently becomes a problem. You know, some some people are like, well, I have to go there to make it, and then I'll come back home. Yeah, you can totally do that too, mm -hmm. or you can build something right there with people who are just as de dedicated to you, but it's mm -hmm. about having a distinct vision and a process to how you're gonna get there, how you're gonna make that happen. So, you know, the long answer is, you know, I don't feel that you have to be any one place. The density of competent craftsmen and artisans makes a difference of like, que se mueve, you know, and, yeah. how, and how you continue to grow, 1000%. Yeah, I think networking, that's something that I, I in my experience so far, 
networking horizontal works way better than trying to network upwards. Mm. And that's something that people, I think they miss all the time. Mm. You're better off making strong connections with the people who are in your same range. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a marathon thing. Like you and I met a very long time ago. Yeah. Like very long time ago. And time flies, man. When you think about it, it's yeah. like five years ago. That's a very long time. That's half a decade. Yeah. And I remember like we would have a couple conversations and I was like, like, I believe in you. I believe in your talent. Thank you, brother. And I have seen your work ethic. Yeah. So for me, it's just a matter of time before you get to where you're going. It's not if, when. It's just when. Yeah, 100%. Now, yeah. in five years, you and I are... But now it's like, yeah, we go way back. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you got famous and now I'm some dude that wants to rope you in to be in my movie. It's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 100% honest friendship. We have been through different projects being far away being in the same town working on this project things go well things go bad we get into arguments with people and still like no kenny's a good guy like don't worry like that is building there yeah yeah yeah. you have to network with your peers 1000 percent. way more than trying to go after the famous person that might 1, change your life because i i think we fall prey to thinking oh if maybe if i meet the right like person the right actor or the right director the right this or that it's going to change my career and change my life yeah it's not man so yeah. far in my experience no i agree because yeah. you know you're you're trying to hitch a wa your wagon to someone else's success it's different if you're like if you come like it'd be different if you're trying to work with somebody who is very seasoned has a very recognizable name but you've been doing really awesome work and very and working really diligently that they they might not know you they be like who what they're nobody they read your script and be like wow they wrote this what else have they done well they've only made films here mm -hmm. let's see them and then they see them and be like wow this is quality storytelling yeah 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 man yeah so those things can mm -hmm. happen but for you to, you know, snowball chance in hell to, to make this happen. And it's like, the only way that I become a success is if they say yes to this thing. Again, man, it's like, mm -hmm. and, and it, it feels disingenuine. You know, the whole purpose of networking, you know, is like, for me anyways, is, is a credo of giver's gain. You know, how can I be a tool and a resource to support what it is that you're doing? Before I tell you what I, like, what is it you're working on? How is it you're trying to grow? Maybe it's not. Maybe I have the assumption that like, oh, we're the same type of artist or craftsman, and we're not. Mm -hmm. And maybe I had in my mind that like you were my guy for this project, and then we start talking. And I'm like, we don't vibe how I thought I would. Mm -hmm. I still like the work that they do. I'd still like to help them. It's just that changes. So not being so headstrong on like this needs to happen this way in order for me to be. It's like no. How do how do I become a resource for other people? You know, how do I really listen to what it is that they're trying to do so I can add value to those things? Mm -hmm. uh, those things are inherently the, the, the most important parts of, of networking is really giver's gain. Because that in and of itself, you become kind of an authority figure in the sense. Because, hey, I'm an active listener and, man, I would listen to what Axel had going on. And, man, I really want to work with him. I want him to be the DP on this or direct this. But he's telling me all these things that he's working on right now. He's obviously not going to have the time to work on my thing. But he told me this, that he needs a composer. I know a composer. Let me do that. And I looked out for you in the creative process. And I cared about the stuff that you were building that wasn't my thing. And then later on, that might open up a window to then. And it also might not be the right time for your project. That's the difficult thing about film. But it's also the beautiful thing about hearing people's experiences. Because I think... Um, Man, what's now? I'm forgetting the name of, but the uh, the Safety Brothers project with Adam Sandler. That film was, uh, I think, like ten years in the making. You know. And do you have that type of aggressive patience? Uh, the gems. Uncut gems. Yeah, That's uncut what it gems. is. I wouldn't hitch my wagon to anybody's train just because I think that like, oh, if they're in this thing or they get to know me, then that'll be the thing that changes my life. Yeah. Do everything you can to change your own life, man, and enjoy the process. So going off of that, 
I know that you have been directing some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have a very like entrepreneurial like thing. Like you were always like from some of the actors that I work with, mm -hmm. you could be a pain in the ass, man. Let me tell you, because yeah. sometimes you're like send an email like I need a copy of the footage. I need this because I want to submit it to this festival. I want to like do this with the film. It's like almost you take a film that we were doing and we were trying to like push it along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how is the transition or I think how is the process now that you're like pushing your own things yeah and trying to make films direct all of that tell me about that uh it's informed my acting process 1000% you know you it also makes you hyper aware of like when things don't go your way it's like it's probably not for the reasons why you thought you know it's like so I directed this uh short film many years ago now it was a 12 minute silent film called Audrey and yeah, I remember yeah. Audrey, you showed me that. Yeah. And so uh, I was casting an older lady. And originally, I wanted an older Asian actress for this role of this lady on the bus. I put it on Actors Access. There was no, at least in the vicinity of where I was casting in the Southeast, there was no older Asian actress between the ages of like upper 60s to like mid 70s. So then I opened it to all ethnicities, right? And then I got like maybe 30 people who wanted to audition. Out of those 30, there were like eight that had m material that I could sift through and say, okay, they, they have chops. That's right? pretty good though. Sure. Like and out of, out of those eight, it was probably five that kind of aesthetic like look wise i was like oh it, it could be them yeah out of those five i really wanted one what's funny is she was the one who didn't send in an audition tape so then it was between her and these uh it was between these other two actresses right and i one of the actresses uh was of a smaller stature which I felt was like very delicate to the scene. She also was like right on the nose with like the way I imagined it. it the, 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 the audition was, it was uh, unscripted. It was just like a series of actions. And everything she did was like how I saw it. The other one, I absolutely loved what she did. I absolutely loved what she did, but it wasn't like what I was specifically looking for. So that's the reason why I chose the other actress. But again, that informs the acting, right? Of like, well, I can't, you know, I crushed that audition and, you know, I, I really, and I did, 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 and it's like, it could be as simple as like, hey, you know, you, you looked a little too young or you gave a great performance, but it wasn't directly in their vision of the way they did something. Or the script could have changed and be like, well, we don't want a guy anymore. We, we want it to be a woman, mm -hmm. you know, or we, we look at the script and we just don't even need that scene anymore. We and caught it. Yeah, it's, it's so tricky, man. That's why I tell actors all the time that I really respect the behind the scenes work that they have to do. And like <laughs> the whole like doing auditions and self taping and sending it in and like just being rejected over and over and over again. Sure. Because I've been on projects like I remember. I was in Atlanta, I was working as a location uh, scout, and I was in the van doing director scouts, and the executive producers and the directors were on the van, and they would get emails with tapes for people that were gonna be on the show. So, Kenny, it's like, we're shooting in, like, it's Wednesday, we shoot on Monday. Like, it's absolute chaos. Like they have so much on their plate and they're still figuring out who's going to be in the show. Yeah. Like, and we're shooting next week. Yeah. They get an email and it's like from casting at the studio, they send them, okay, for this role, these are the two options that we have for you mm -hmm. because they already sifted through all the auditions yeah. blah, 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 and they watch at that. We are in a van driving all around Atlanta and it's like in between phone calls and meetings and like things absolute crisis mode and then they take a look at that with the little headphones in the van as they do this yeah and then they have to make a decision yeah and it's just like okay this one yeah when you when i learned that and i saw it happen over and over and over again yeah. even for like leads on the on the episodes 
we wouldn't have them until like a few days before we start shooting. Yeah. Then I make sure that every actor friend that I have, I tell them that story. Yeah. Because I think you guys face so much rejection. Sure. But it's just not even about you. No. And that's, a, that's inherently the problem is like people make it about themselves and that, you know, that's a deeper conversation about ego and that can be a whole separate podcast, but like that, it clouds your judgment. It clouds the work that you're doing, uh, it, it, you know, and, and it clouds your effectiveness when you, when you think about that. It, it, sometimes it could be, you crush that audition, but guess what? You were the 25th person to turn that audition in. And because of time, I looked at the first five and out of those first five, that third guy. Yeah. So we didn't even watch the other tapes. Mm -hmm. Go. So now that you mentioned ego, I, I think I want to get into that conversation. Yeah, Just because <laughs> I believe you require a high level of ego in that sense of the word on like the evil sense of the word, if you want to put it that way, or the darker sense of the world. Yeah. To go after being an actor or maybe not just an actor being a movie star and this is a conversation that I, I was having the other day with some actor friends of mine yeah i'm like my friend was saying well i just want to be like a working actor i just want to and i'm like fuck that like yeah, yeah. you should be a movie star you yeah. should try to do as much as you can because it's so hard that even if you have that ambition and that self-confidence it's so hard that you it's not guaranteed you're probably gonna land over here how do you feel about that i think it's important to do what makes you happy at the end of the day you know i, I don't i don't like to shit on anybody there and there, and then there's a there's also a difference between like movie stars in my opinion and like artists not that they can't be one in the same they're often not and not everybody wants the same thing. I what think the movie want? star, I, I, I love, I really care about my art, man. I really care about my art. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about fame. I don't think about money. I think not that I don't understand how important those things could be and the opportunities they could provide, not just for me, but for other people that I really care about. You talk about, but it, it's like, what's your level of comfortability? You know, because I think about, you know, The Rock, you know, movie star. I think the last great movie star is Tom Cruise, truthfully. But I've also had the pleasure of working with Kevin Hart. And Kevin Hart, in my opinion, having worked with him, is the hardest working man I've ever seen that's in the entertainment industry. His life is not the life for everyone because it takes an insane amount of discipline it also takes the right acumen the right personality and the right understanding of like i think one of the biggest things i learned from him is uh in watching him is he really values the team that he's built around him and that's important you know if you want to be a working actor and be gamefully employed and be on a show for X amount of time and da 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 da. That's great. And if that really makes you happy, great. Figure out how you're going to do that and do that. Don't don't say that because it's like, well, if it doesn't work out and I can't be a movie star, I guess I'll be a working actor. No, what, like, what do you really care about and what are you trying to do? You know. And at the end of the day, knowing yourself first and not saying, well, I have to be this. If that happens, great. If you wanted to, because there's other people who have that level of success. And they didn't really want it. Mm -hmm. So I think at the end of the day, it's about knowing yourself first and foremost. And, you know, whatever becomes of that, you know, be happy with the results, with the effort that you put in and the diligent planning that you did or didn't do and what you cared and didn't care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was like uh, it was a play on on Die Hard, and and, and it was it's kind of like Die Hard meets the Truman Show, and and even that experience was uh, was funny uh, because of the platform it was going to live on. It was going to live on Quibi, and then mm -hmm. no one could have predicted the pandemic was going to happen. So the amount of visibility that that show got 
was less than it probably would have gotten had the pandemic not happened because that platform was built for watching these quick bite episodes Mm -hmm. on your mobile device. So there wasn't a platform that all those like 75 of those shows that were on Quibi are now I think they were rebranded as they live on Roku. So they, they're, they're known as Roku Originals. So that's where that series lives now. Um, but yeah, just getting to work on, on that set and uh, seeing how hard he works. And some really talented people. Uh, really awesome director, uh, uh, Eric Appel, who was on that and uh, you know allowed me the days that I wasn't on set to come and watch his process and the way these actors were doing things. So it was a, it was a really awesome learning experience, some really awesome people. Uh, and again, it was, it, I, I credit that to the production that was involved with that and, uh, and also watching Kevin work, the understanding of like how important it is um, to have a solid team. You know, if, if you're trying you- to build bigger, bigger things, it's, you can't do it by yourself. So what do you remember from the team? Uh, like how many people, like what were their roles? What do you remember from that? Well, I just remember that uh, at the time, uh, again, this no one could have predicted the, that COVID would shut down the world. But at the time, Kevin was doing some pop-up sets at the Laughing Skull uh, comedy, sh- uh, comedy theater in Atlanta. Uh, it was what was going to be his next special. So he was testing out new material. And then he, then that turned into, instead of pop-ups, it turned into a residency. So besides shooting our project, he had that residency. So he had people helping with organize that. At the same time, he was slated to shoot two more movies. I, I don't know for a fact if the Wesley Snipes movie that, uh, or show that he did, which is on Netflix, was going to be the one going. But the, the next one slated after that was this film that he did with Woody Harrelson called The Man from Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember that because in the middle of shooting Die Hard, I was getting breakdowns to audition from The Man from Toronto. So again, you can accomplish great things without a great team. And that was one of the things that I was able to bear witness of mm-hmm. how he worked, how diligent he was. And I, and I remember... Uh, just watching him and uh, one of the assistants was like telling him that he had, had to eat and like sit down and eat and he, he was saying he's like man if I sit down I'm gonna fall asleep and what was funny is the last day I was actually shooting with him he broke for lunch late and I was talking to uh, one of his friends who's on his team and they were talking about like after this we're gonna shut everything down for about a week go back out west and then come back like two weeks later and then we shoot this other thing by the time he finishes telling me this, I look over to Kevin and he's asleep with a plate of food just like this. But that's like how hard the, that expenditure of energy and that, that level of focus that like when you take a break, it's just a because you absolutely have to. So it was, that was the, really impressive to see that level of focus and dedication and energy. Yeah. yeah. So what projects are you working on right now that you're excited about? Um, Well, I have a a slew of projects that are um, coming out. The two episodes, I was on uh, this Mike Tyson series. It's on Hulu. It's called Mike. That's actually where I wore this shirt. What's funny is this this is Trevante Rhodes as Mike Tyson. Okay. And uh, I kept a little memento from from set. But uh, I'm in these last two episodes of that mm-hmm. series. Yeah, so some images from that. Are you like his yeah, coach? Yeah, I play his cut man. Okay. Yeah, so I got a couple extra scenes um, throughout the duration of that shooting, and I there's just one scene that's up on my Instagram that you can watch me doing mitt work with Trevante as Mike, and he was really great. Um, besides that, I have a film that I'm going to be in that got its world premiere at, the Toronto International Film Festival. Wow. It's called Devotion. It's starring uh, Glenn Powell, who's just in uh, the new Top Gun. He played Hangman. And then this very talented actor uh, named Jonathan Majors. And so the film is a Korean war epic, which was really fun to shoot because it was the first time I was part of a, a period piece. So I play a Marine uh, dispatcher in the film and you know just being dressed in that authentic gear and all the talented people who worked on that. So you can ca- catch those two episodes of uh, that I'm in on Mike uh, on Hulu. Mm-hmm. And then I believe the actual worldwide release for this film, Devotion, 
comes out in November. And besides that, I've got a couple other projects that are kind of in development and, and something that I'm waiting to get uh, some dates back for to shoot on a, on an upcoming feature. So I've got some things in the works, some, some short film projects and then a feature that, you know, are kind of waiting in the wind and that's what I'm working on right now, brother. That's awesome. So Kenny, if time was not an issue yeah. and money was not an issue, yeah, what would you want to do with your life? Just keep traveling, keep traveling. And, and uh, it, it's, I've had the pleasure of being able to work in different cities you know, and uh, getting to know people. So if time and money wasn't an issue, I just, you know, kind of like Kung Fu, the legend continues, just like walk the earth and get, get to know people and, and get to understand the things that they're affected by and what makes them tick and, and the perspective that that's lent and the reality that exists for them. So in a sense, I mean, it's still studying narrative, but it like in a very humanistic way. So if time and money wasn't an issue, I'd just be doing that. That's awesome. Well, man, thank you so much. Brother, I love you, man. Thank yeah, you so much. I love you too. I respect you a lot, and thank I'm you. super excited to see like all the projects you're going to work on. So yeah. thanks for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah.